Stand by. Is this thing on? Yes, Dan. Oh, hello. You're listening to Old News with Dan and Carrie. This just in. Breaking news to report. We are live. Old newscasters reunite. Uh, can we just say former? Sure. Former newscasters reunite behind the mic after more than 20 years. Old news is good news. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Old News. This week, we continue our conversation with Emeritus Professor James Hoyt from the University of Wisconsin-Madison Journalism Department. Professor Hoyt was the head of the J School, the chairman of the UW Athletic Board, and faculty rep to the NCAA and Big Ten Conference. We talked in depth about Professor Hoyt's career and legacy in last week's episode, but we had so many questions left that we invited Professor Hoyt back on the podcast, and he graciously said yes. Thank you for joining us once again, Professor Hoyt. And well, I and I you brought you as a special guest. I, I have to explain the furball here. I thought <laughs> it would be okay if she was here. She's afraid because we have a chirping um, smoke detector in the house right now. But this is Madison. So I thought, well, since she fits the theme of your career, she could stay. Good, good. Hi, Madison. We're happy to have you with us. <laughs> and other dogs, Bucky and Bascom, I'll give them a little shout, shout <laughs> out as well. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I will put a link to our episode from last week so other people can hear about the amazing career that you've had and the incredible impact you have had on students, including myself. But this week, we're going to start by talking about your work having Bob Teague recognized. So Bob Teague was a a journalism student at the University of Wisconsin. He went on to be a very accomplished journalist. He was also the first black football player starter, as I understand, on the football team. And you realized there was a wrong you needed to right. Can you tell us about all of that? I'd be happy to talk about this. Bob Teague was a student at the UW in the late 40s and early 50s. He was a journalism major. He came from Milwaukee. Uh, and I'll get into the story but I'll, a little bit, but I'll tell you how I got involved in it. Just mm-hmm. because I had met Bob, I knew him as a television journalist for NBC News in New York. And I learned about his athletic career in Madison and th- discovered in part of my research that he had been, you say, the first black player to start in a football game for the University of Wisconsin. And so I began to look at that and study it, knowing that he was a journalism student, I was uh, a journalism graduate, I was intrigued at his story. Um, discovered that there was, a, there was an oversight here in, the, in, in terms of the Athletic Hall of Fame. I began looking at the Hall of Fame, I just assumed that he was there. He's a distinguished uh, service alum of the journalism school, but had not been recognized or acknowledged in any way uh, by the athletic department. So I started to look through the records and to see what his status really was. He had been a recruited student athlete, had come here uh, in the, uh, the late 40s, as I said, and sat on the bench. He played for the hmm. junior varsity team and didn't play. There was a coach who was reluctant or unwilling to let him play. Finally, with a turnover in coaches, the Mm. new coach, Ivy Williamson, came in and Ivy Williamson saw the talent in Bob Teague and let him start. And the first play that he got in his first game, which was three games into his senior season, he scored a touchdown. That season, he he led the team in rushing, led the team in scoring, was second in the conference in scoring became a second string all conference first string all conference player and uh, <clears throat> received the number of professional football offers one from the green bay packers mm. but decided that he wanted to go into journalism mm. and so he went back to his hometown of milwaukee uh, got a job as a reporter for the milwaukee journal he was the first black reporter at the milwaukee journal mm. um, after a couple of years at the milwaukee journal he uh, enlisted in the army during world war ii came out and went to New York City and began working as a journalist for the New York Times. Hmm. So he was, for the Times, he covered sports uh, as well as kind of random assortment of current events. From the New York Times, he was recruited by NBC News and went to NBC initially as a reporter for WNBC for Channel 4 for their local station, then became an anchor at, uh, at Channel 4 and then went to NBC News where he was a, a reporter 
uh, and did a number of backup anchoring. Uh, had a number of backup anchoring positions there. So accomplished journalistically, but athletically, his role might have even been as significant, if not more so, because of the way that he became recognized, breaking through the, the color barrier on the uh, the football team. So I started to investigate this and I got all this together and then I started to put together a case for him. But I realized one thing I didn't know was anything about his family. I mean, I knew about them, but I didn't know where they were, if they were still alive or anything. Um, so I had to put on my old investigative reporter's hat <laughs> and began to try to track down family members. I learned that his, his wife was deceased. Mm. I learned that there were no other um, family members other than one son, Adam. And I discovered in my research, there was a lot of Adam Teagues in the mm. country. And I, as I said, my reporters had, I ca called the funeral home that had handled Bob Teague's funeral when he had passed away. I tried to get I, addresses or phone numbers or email addresses for family members. Finally, after extensive work of a number of months, I hit had a hit on an Adam Teague, hmm. Adam Teague, who was working in Schenectady, New York. And uh, finally, through a variety of phone connections, managed to get a hold of Adam, and in fact, was Bob Teague's son. Yeah. And we wanted, we didn't want to go ahead and do this without his family's knowledge or without his family's blessing to do it. So I had extended conversations with Adam, who was very supportive of them going ahead with this um, uh, recognition. And I was so thrilled that Adam Teague uh, came out for the ceremony last fall uh, when his father got recognized and inducted into the UW-Madison Athletic Hall of Fame. For me, it was my interest in journalism, my interest in broadcasting, my interest in athletics, and my interest in racial equity that all kind of came together in wanting to do this. And it was a, took almost two years to oh, get wow. together all that was needed, especially to try to track down the family member. And there mm. was only one of them, and that was why it took uh, as long as it did uh, to get that recognition. What uh, steps reading, did you have to take to get that recognition? How, what did you have to do to get him into the Hall of Fame? Well, I had to pre I had to prepare a case. I had to get a variety of supporting materials, including letters from uh, other primarily African-American athletes who said uh, that because of Bob Teague, they had a chance to compete at Wisconsin where they never would have had it before, that he blazed the trail. Oh. That uh, he, without him, one of them very poignantly said, with, uh, well, to tell you who he was, it's a public record. Elsie uh, Higginbottom was a track athlete in the uh, in the 1960s and a very successful businessman in Chicago. And Elsie said, if it hadn't been for Bob Teague, there would never have been an Elsie Higginbottom because hmm. he would not have blazed the trail to give me an opportunity to compete in intercollegiate athletics. So I had to get the support from them. I had to document his career and again, get support from his family. I had to make sure that I had all of the, the records straight and then present it to a committee in the athletic department that frankly was a little apprehensive because they had heard his name suggested before and they had never moved on it, had not taken oh. any action. And so now that I was kind of presenting them more evidence than they had before and uh, had a very powerful letter from Pat Richter uh, the former athletic director, I never even asked Pat for a letter. He just volunteered. He said, wow. now that you're doing this, I need to weigh in uh -huh. and um, wrote a very powerful, uh, as I said, letter of support also. Uh, so combining that all together, uh, the committee voted in favor of it. And last fall, a little over a year ago now, he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. And as I said, I was so happy that Adam Teague was able to be here uh, to uh, to be a part of this. I'm going to mention one other thing. I actually had met Bob Teague on a couple of occasions, mm. and that was part of my interest also. When I was a PhD student in 1969, he was given a Distinguished Service Award by the Journalism School and came from New York City to Madison to receive that. And I was appointed to a small kind of hosting committee. I was a PhD student at the time to be people who kind of hung around with him and made him feel welcome for the weekend. So I had met him that weekend. And then when I was working at NBC News in Washington, later in my career, we crossed paths on a couple occasions. I was, although I was in Washington and he was in New York, on one occasion, he came down to Washington to work on a story out of there. 
and I would occasionally do weekend shifts uh, at NBC Radio in New York City, and uh, we cross paths there. Mm. And we had these few conversations, and I always remember him saying, uh, I didn't talk about his football career a lot, but he said, I was always thankful to Ivy Williamson. He gave me my chance. He mm. finally gave me an opportunity. And uh, so he was so grateful for that. So it felt personal to me mm. because I had had that opportunity to meet him, although not in it for extended periods of time, but I've met him on a couple on two or three different occasions. Mm. Fantastic story. You know, I he was also an author, I believe, because I think, uh, uh, Professor Hoyt, that I read a book by him sometime in college, I think it was called like Live and Off Color or something yeah. like that. And yeah. and it was an inspiring, it kind of actually was one of the reasons that I decided to go into journalism because mm -hmm. of that book I read by Bob Teague. Because um, yeah. he, he really, I remember this book because it really described working out in the field and being a reporter and, you know, also the challenges that he had as, as a, a person of color out there. So it was a really good book. I remember, I think he had a couple of books, didn't he? Yes, he did. That was, uh, that was about his second or third book. And, uh, and he was very forthcoming. He was very direct. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll go refer to that one again in just a moment, but this first book, uh, which I love and I reread again just last year was a book called uh, Letters to a Black Boy. And it was written in the form of letters to his son, to Adam. So Adam yeah. was here. Oh, yeah. And it wasn't written in kind of, a, kind of a negative way. It was kind of just, I'm telling my son things that I had to live through, things that right. I had to go through so that he can understand and appreciate the life that I lived. But Back to the live and off color, the one story that stands out to me as evidence of what he would have to had to put up with working at NBC News at those during that time. He tells a story about how he was asked to serve on a panel for Meet the Press on yeah. a Sunday morning Meet the Press program. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he hadn't, that was new to him. He hadn't been asked before. And so the, uh, the moderator of uh, Meet the Press asked him if he would do it. And uh, said, we're having as our guest uh, is a, a black civil rights leader, Ralph Farmer, as the guest. And uh, Bob Teague listened to him and he said, okay, I'll tell you what. I'll do it under one condition. And that condition is you also invite me to come back again on a future Sunday when the guest is not a black civil rights mm -hmm. leader. Yes. I remember and that the story. moderator said, the moderator said to him, well, then forget it. Yeah. Oh, wow. So he experienced at the highest levels of our profession, he experienced that kind of racist. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, just today I was reading an article. Um, I think it was from the New York Times about him. And they were saying that they he was always sent out in the protests because they thought that he would just be invincible being a black journalist. It's like you you go out in that. And he always got sent out to these situations that might have been deemed dangerous for the white reporters. Yep. And, and he, he talked about that mm -hmm. uh, yep. a, a number of times. And uh, and he, he was happy to do it and he did it well, but he also resented it a little bit mm -hmm. that he was kind of being put in a position that other reporters wouldn't necessarily be put in, that they could, mm -hmm. he could take advantage of that. So last year, September 15th, was the day that uh, he was inducted. Adam was there. And yes. and what kind of things did Adam tell you being there honoring his father 10 years he after was, he had died? Adam, Adam, unlike his father, was not a man of many words. Mm. But he, he said that... Uh, I think the thing that I took away from my conversations with him, he said, my, my dad was not bitter. He, mm. he, he wasn't bitter because of this. He just considered it a challenge and something that he needed to do for himself uh, and for the entire, it made broadcast journalism better that he stood up and took those, those positions. And he said two or three occasions, he said he, he, was, he was not a bitter person. He, he didn't hold grudges. But he just plowed forward and said that this is my role to do this and to do this well. Fantastic. I mean, it, did you take that as you know part? You were able to kind of get the the 
the machine rolling on getting him into the Hall of Fame. Did you champion uh, any other people in that way? I mean, it sounds to me like just from hearing from Gary and all of the other people who have mentioned the impact you've had on their life, did you take did you take others, I, I suppose, under your wing and try to champion their cause along the way? There was only one other, a few, about maybe three years before that, that I did a, I played a similar role, although not not quite as major as I did with Bob Teague. It was a inductee into the Athletic Hall of Fame named Guy Lohman. Guy Lohman had been a football coach, a basketball coach, and baseball coach at Wisconsin. Oh my goodness. Wow. And, uh, and also a physical education teacher. Mm. <laughs> Back when we had a baseball team, our baseball field was the Guy Lohman Field. Oh, yep. I remember Guy Lohman, he was somebody who, as a coach, uh, had coached so many sports and had been successful in all of these sports, but he just kind of got put by the wayside. He, he lost attention because he kind of maybe he did too much. And I started to look at his career and think how dramatic that was and it coincidentally i happened to meet his granddaughter mm. um, and uh she we talked about this and she had kind of the same story say we walked her through the hall of fame and i was looking for his plaque and i didn't see his plaque there and we said and i looked and i said no he's not there i said well this is something that we need to work on so uh. they succeeded that and she took the lead in doing a lot of that work but i uh, uh also uh was involved in kind of getting the connections made and helping yeah. steer that one through, but not to the degree that I did for uh, for Bob Teague. Right, mm -hmm. right. What kind of personal satisfaction did you get from having Bob Teague inducted then? Oh, uh, I would say it was extreme uh, because, as I said, all of the things that I thought were being played out in the in that story because of my multiple interests in it. And because it had been uh, something that had been forgotten, that had been overlooked for so many years, and uh, you know, writing a wrong would be not a uh, uh, an improper way of putting it. And then when they pulled out a, a a photo when I mentioned that Ivy Williamson, the new coach, was one who had uh, <clears throat> finally given him his chance, the photo that the athletic department pulled out of Ivy Williamson showed him on the sideline and sitting on the bench right behind him was Bob Teague. Was Bob. Wow. So it was a strong photograph that had both of them together. Uh, hmm. Maybe not quite the symbolism you would like because Ivy Williamson put him into the game, but he was- He had taken him off the bench finally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the two of them together, and uh, again, uh, Bob Teague being so grateful that Ivy Williamson gave him an opportunity. The presidential election is happening in a few weeks, and I was just wondering, what advice do you have for news consumers to get the most accurate presidential or, um, news of the day to really help form an informed opinion about who to vote for? It's something that concerns me a lot um, because the, the all of the evidence that I'm seeing of news consumers of being so focused on only paying attention to information or only listening to newscasts or only reading stories that they agree with. Mm -hmm. that their reluctance to expose themselves to anything different. And I've used the line a number of times, maybe I used it last time on here, I don't recall, but I'm so convinced and so worried that consumers are not looking for information, they're looking for ammunition. Mm. I'm looking for information I agree with that I can nail the other guy with. So they're not paying attention to other information that's out there. And unfortunately, they have channels, they have publications that pander to them, that are exclusively focusing on their interests. There are publications out there, I would, uh, I mean, without being political uh, on it, there, there are publications such as the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and others that have a wide range of articles um, on all sides of the question, all sides of uh, political equation that are not being paid attention to because they include sides that readers don't necessarily want to read. Mm. And to me, it has it begins with the audience. Unfortunately, there's too many narrow uh, 
focused publications that people can get access to. Anybody, as I've said a number of times, anybody who wants to be a journalist can. Anybody who wants to host the website can. And nobody can force anybody to read them, but readers have an opportunity to read so many publications that are so narrow, so focused, that they don't get exposed to anything else. That didn't, that didn't used to be the case when you had the kind of broad-based community newspapers, large city newspapers that covered the entire spectrum. And you could, once you bought the paper, you could choose to read what you chose to read. Mm -hmm. That would be fine, but at least it was there in your universe available for you to read. Where that puts journalists, I'm not sure. I'm, mm -hmm. I wish that they could come up with a format that would present various sides in ways that everybody would would be willing to listen to them. The debates this year probably came closest to that, where you, to in order to hear one, you had to hear the other. In order to read one side, you had to read another side or listen to one side, you had to listen to the other side. But to, to the journalists, I think the the old adage of being fair, not necessarily being balanced, but being fair to both sides, making sure they get covered uh, adequately has to be at the forefront. And that's easy for me to say if you don't have audience members paying mm -hmm. attention to. Mm -hmm. But so I didn't really do a good job answering your question, but I kind of put in play the various elements that I see as being bothersome going forward in this arena now. Well, it's very complicated. And also for a large, for a large part of what you were talking about, print journalism is kind of where you were landing. And then talk about, if you can, a little bit of broadcast and digital journalism too, that, I mean, there's so many, there's so many places you can get news mm -hmm. now and broadcast news takes i mean one of our guests in the past was scott klug who said that you know he had a very high number i can't remember what it was but many many journalists are considered to be liberal mm -hmm. where can people find you know a, a tilt somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. in your opinion You know, it's a, it's again goes back to my saying it's, it's a difficult position for journalists who want to do that, because if you do that, you're risking losing part of your audience, and they, that's what they they want to not do. But the pressure that is on them to deliver a broad based uh, product that would be trusted by a variety of voters, a variety of citizens, is stronger than it has ever been. And mm -hmm. if somebody knew the answer to it, I think he would be doing it right now. Mm. Right. Yeah. I'm not Agreed. sure that that's, uh, <clears throat> that that's out there, but it's, I don't think we can give up. I don't think we, we cannot do it. But on the other hand, it becomes so easy for an audience member to just choose my channel, to choose my publication, to choose whatever I want mm -hmm. and just focus on that only and ignore everything else that's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. I also think there is a problem in journalism, and that is the kind of false equivalency. That if we say something positive about candidate A, then we have to say something positive about candidate B. Mm. If we say something negative about candidate A, then we have to say something negative about candidate B. We just need to balance them off. And in some cases, the issues, the topics, when there's truth involved, somebody saying, telling the truth and somebody isn't, to balance them off and say, well, so-and-so said this and so-and-so said this, it's not a, a fair equivalency. It's, it's a false equivalency, as I said, because you make mm -hmm. them sound and look like they have equal points of view, whereas one is well-informed and one may not be. You have uh, <clears throat> I, One example I saw recently was you have a, a scientific study that is established in one position, and then you have some... Uh, somebody who has done no research whatsoever and is a conspiracy theorist who says the opposite. Hmm. So do you trade them off one against the other and say, well, on the one hand, there's this scientist who says this. Yeah, he's spent his whole life working on that and studying that. He has an informed opinion. I mean, you have this person over here, a uh, conspiracy theorist who's heard something from somebody somewhere and says the opposite. It hmm. right. kind of sounds Sorry. like there's two opinion, two views that are equivalent to each other. And that's where I come up with the term false equivalency. It's not a fair equivalent. So 
that needs needs to be made clear. I think they can do that, and whether the audience accepts it or not, that's the other issue. Mm -hmm. I can't go there. <laughs> mm -hmm. One tip that um, Katie Culver had offered um, when we spoke to her on a previous podcast, she's also head of the, uh, or she's now head of the U, uh, University of Wisconsin Journalism School, and she had suggested changing your home screen every day or every time you sit down just so you could see a different point of view on the news so you're not just constantly getting news from the same source. I thought that was a good idea. That's a wonderful idea. I hadn't heard that before. She didn't <laughs> mention that to me. I think that would be something that would be have a win be a win win. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many people would actually do it, but right, uh, right. But yeah. yes. But good food for thought. Good food yeah. for thought. What about um, polit political advertising? I know Dan and I have lamented um, off podcasts <laughs> like, oh my gosh, we're so tired of watching political ads and getting all the mailers just slamming each other. It, does any good come out of all of those negative ads? I don't think so. I think I, I think there are, I watch the ads for the candidates that I support I don't watch the ads for the candidates that I don't and I think most mm -hmm. people are that way it just it infiltrates this the airwaves and what it leads to is this kind of false uh, yardstick measuring who's most successful because who raised the most money and by the most money means who can put so many ads on I can put on 12 ads every two hours and Nick he can only put on 11 ads every two hours so I'm better I've raised mm -hmm. more money to do that mm -hmm. I don't think it contributes anything to the overall election information, uh, but it does raise the risk of a repeated falsity gets repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. And, repeated, mm -hmm. and some can start to believe false information that we're on either side of the political spectrum when it just gets repeated that much. But there's bottom line is there's nothing they can do about it. The, mm -hmm. the, the way the laws are political candidates advertising has priority they can only charge them their lowest rate uh, and they have to have equivalent spaces for each candidate and there's virtually nothing a station can do about advertising that a candidate wants to submit as long as they, they pay the bill for it they, they meet the rate card and uh, and pay for the advertising um, I, I don't find it informative in any way um, and uh, as I said, I tune out almost every time they come mm -hmm. on. I don't think that it has any impact in changing minds. It may reinforce some, but it might not. Mm. not I, 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 I find myself candidate and say, "Oh, I saw a, saw a campaign commercial for the other candidate, and it was really good, so I'm going to switch my vote." Uh, right. <laughs> I find myself actually, you know, you'll you'll be watching television at night because I'm over 55 and I watch TV. <laughs> um, so, but I'll be watching TV at night and then one ad will come on for one candidate and the candidate of the other party comes on right one after the other. And I think I said this to Carrie before, I find myself laughing out loud sometimes because mm -hmm. they're so absurd. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, like you said, it's it's actually scary when you think about it because they're just absurd claims about about both candidates sometimes and and i just sit there thinking to myself like who actually believes this yeah. who who is who is making their decision based on these commercials but i think it's kind of that whole numbing net you know it just numbs people and numbs people and then there must be some psychology behind it that sooner or later just the negative feelings you get from a certain advertisement might have some impact on the way you vote when you're in the polling place. Because um, why else would they do it? Yeah. I don't think we'll know the answer until after the election when the research right. gets done. Uh, right. about, but, but yeah, they, they sure are They sure are getting good at making horrible negative commercials, aren't they? Wow. Mm -hmm. All the, the video effects to make everybody look like a criminal. Right. Uh, all right. Well, now I'd like to totally switch gears to something you worked on in the 70s. In the 70s, you served on the Wisconsin Supreme Court's Committee on Cameras in the Courtroom. How did you get involved with that and why did you get involved? 
Well, it was a it was a significant public issue at the time when the assumption was that cameras were not involved in court or permitted in courtrooms. Like there was only one state or two states, Florida and Colorado, that even had some exceptions that you could permit cameras in courtrooms. Hmm. So the assumption was cameras are not compatible with free trials. And uh, some states began to question that. Wisconsin was involved in that. And um, I had done some research on the, the effects of being televised. The, the concern was that witnesses would not remember correctly, their memories would be distorted, they might grandstand before the cameras, that the presence of the camera in the courtroom would have a negative effect on justice. Hmm. And uh, there was no evidence one way or the other, it was just kind of an assumption. And uh, for the most part, judges and attorneys agreed that that was probably the case and uh, journalists disagreed. Uh, there was, uh, a variety of groups in a variety of states that were trying to get it put in the public agenda. Fortunately, Wisconsin happened to be one of the leaders in that area. Um, a group uh, in, I think it was the Milwaukee Junior Bar Association, kind of got the ball rolling, put together an ad hoc group in Milwaukee of a couple of attorneys, a couple of judges, and a couple of journalists, and then expanded to be a statewide organization. And uh, I had a, uh, a call from uh, one of the uh, justices on the Supreme Court, Shirley Abrahamson, uh, knowing that I had done some research on the topic, if I would be willing to be a party to this committee, the Wisconsin Committee on Courtroom Cameras, to review the status of it and to make recommendations if we thought appropriate for what the state might do. Well, the uh, Chief Justice Bruce, Bruce Bialfus at the time appointed me to this committee and uh, we did a very extensive uh, job for almost for more than a year, about a year and a half in Wisconsin, holding hearings around the state, talking to judges, talking to defense attorneys, talking to prosecutors, talking to journalists. And it turned out that for the most part, they were fearing the unknown. They were afraid of something that they had not, nobody had experienced. Like everybody knows that witnesses are gonna grandstand if there's a camera on. Well, how do we know that? Um, they're performing for the judge or they're performing for the jury, they're not performing for the camera. Mm -hmm. So we decided to take us a, a, uh, a poll of uh, judges, as I said, and attorneys and journalists and had some very strong support for it. Um, and uh, we presented a report based on our research to the state Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, uh, after reviewing it, decided that they would permit a one year trial period where they would permit some cases to be televised in Wisconsin with the agreement of the parties involved. It had to be agreed to by the prosecution, by the defense and by the judge. And there were some very uh, significant restrictions on how they could do it, but they wanted to just see if any of these kind of uh, wild predictions came through. There was a number of these cases were done around the state and it turned out that uh, for the most part, people came away saying, what's the big deal? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so there's a camera sitting back in the, you know, high, quietly hidden back in the corner of the courtroom. Uh, it doesn't make any noise. <clears throat> Nobody can see it. It doesn't really impact what's going on. The participants in the trial are, again, pleading to the jury or pleading to the judge and uh, turned out to be a issue that very few people were concerned about, other than a few defense attorneys. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Supreme Court, after the this experimental period, um, wrote some uh, rules for camera coverage in Wisconsin, how they uh, had to be in every district of the state. There was a media coordinator who would oversee the conditions under which cameras could be used, would hear out the judges, would hear out the participants in the trial to see if they had any objections to it. But the assumption was that they were going to be televised. You had to provide a compelling reason why you thought the trial would not be fair hmm. if there was televised. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was significant. They gave the burden of proof to the other side. Mm. And uh, during this time, uh, as I said, there were very few problems with it. And the Wisconsin Supreme Court was willing to go ahead and adopt 
uh, some permanent rules, most of which were authored by our committee uh, and uh, put into place in Wisconsin. And Wisconsin was one of the very first states, Wisconsin and Florida, uh, were the two that put in place these rules that said uh, that television could, uh, televising or photographing, I should say, still photography was a part of this also, mm. could be done under these conditions and under the control of the judge. Uh, and the significant thing was, could it be done over the objection of one of the trial participants? What if a defendant didn't want to be televised? Could that veto the television coverage of it? And the court came down and said, no, you, you have to give a reason why. Hmm. Why do you think mm -hmm. that the televising of your trial will make it unfair? And you can't just say you don't have automatic veto power. And that became distinguishing characteristic of Wisconsin. Not only did they permit it, but they didn't permit veto power for participants. And going forward, Wisconsin had very few problems, very few issues with it. Florida was right along with us. And other some other states paid attention. I, at the time, became kind of the spokesperson for the, uh, the committee. And I remember getting invited to go to California, Iowa, Missouri, uh, they actually did go to Florida on one occasion, uh, New Jersey, various places that were considering it, and they wanted to hear about the Wisconsin experience and mm. how it had worked out in Wisconsin. And it became uh, like a snowball getting bigger and bigger, and states mm. began to adopt it, some a little bit more rigorous and some less rigorous, but the ma majority of the other states adopted the Wisconsin rule almost verbatim. Wow. Uh, so I felt good about that, that the, let the language that we had come up with was good enough that other states were willing to say, okay, we'll, we'll abide by the Wisconsin rule. Well, it's worked well for them. It should work well for us. Hmm. And uh, so it has gone forward. And uh, again, this is the state court system. We don't have, we're not there yet with the, anything in the federal courts. Uh, they're still afraid of it. But uh, it was something that was, I'm very proud that I played a role in the Wisconsin committee being the academic on the uh, on the committee, one of two academics on the committee, and kind of brought together this whole coalition of journalists, uh, attorneys, and judges that agreed on this, and uh, Wisconsin was really in the forefront uh, in doing it. And now I think there's only one or two states that don't permit it or have their policies. It's so prohibitive that it's almost impossible uh, to do so, but it took uh, it took a career away from courtroom sketch artists. <laughs> I yeah. was going to say, no sketch more drawing. Were, they were accustomed to uh, drawing their pictures, <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I think it has helped the uh, public to know more and more what's going on within the courtrooms. When well, fifty years later, now I mean, people are so used to having cameras almost everywhere; they're they're you know ubiquitous. I mean doorbells <laughs> every place you go there's cameras mm -hmm. obviously at the federal level you're saying you know we still don't get to see um footage but being a person who came up through journalism i like the idea of the more daylight the better the more we see the better the more information out there the better so do you think we'll get to that point at the federal level at some point just because the generations now are so used to seeing everything yeah, I, th I think it'll come. I think it'll come. I, um, and, I, and I would agree with you completely. It's a generational thing. We have a generation that's grown up with cameras, has grown up with transparency. And uh, I think the question is becoming now, why not? What's, why, why are they, what are they trying to keep from us? And right. uh, the, the, uh, the judicial mentality of uh, let me go in my chambers and lock the door and do justice unto you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to fly and much yeah. longer, but it, uh, there's been some cracks. At least you have audio recordings of the, the U.S. Supreme mm -hmm. Court now, mm -hmm. which we haven't had before. But there's some other areas that they're permitting some experimentation at the federal level. So I, I think it will come. It's just that uh, it's an older generation that's at that level. Mm. Right. Yeah. Mm. Is there anything, uh, uh, Jim, that over the years it, that you can point to that have been some of the more, I guess, the negative impacts on journalism? What are some of the things that you think have hurt journalism over the years? 
But one of the advantages of journalism is also a disadvantage of journalism, and that is because of the First Amendment, anybody can be a journalist. Anybody can say whatever they want, they can publish whatever they want within the limits of libel or obscenity laws, whatever. Uh, but that also means that people can abuse it also. They can abuse it and they can give journalism a black eye. There can be bad players in it. Right. And to distinguish within the, not to say that not all journalists are the same, not all newspapers are the same, not all broadcasting networks are the same, but they all have they have a wide range of opportunities under the First Amendment to be responsible or not. Now, remember one of the uh, very well-known First Amendment lawyers, Floyd Abrams, always said the free freedom of the press, the First Amendment gives you the right to be irresponsible. Mm -hmm. Not to say you should be irresponsible, but gives you the right to be irresponsible if you choose to do so. And if you do so, you might suffer the consequences of it. But you need to have that right. You can't shut it down before you do that. Sure. So that I think it, that that's my issue would be both the 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 positive also becomes a negative if you look at it, it gives you the opportunity to do bad journalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, it's like anything; too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. Yes, I think that plays. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what did you teach students about being an ethical journalist? What are some tools you put in their pockets, if you will? Um to always understand this understand why you're doing this story and understand where the story comes from and who's affected by the story i guess that would be it make sure that the information is accurate make sure that it is thorough make sure that it is uh, out there so that people can understand the story and not to be persuaded by people who might be afraid of it, who might be offended by it, but to just, or by, I mean, add one more to it, or by advertisers mm. who might not like the story, who, who might be, uh, who might be offended by a story that they, uh, they may not agree with. But to be able to do that, to have the freedom to do that, and to disclose what you're doing and why you're doing it. There's no reason to not be fully transparent if you're a journalist, I would, I would say. Um, there was a period a while back when there was a push for local news councils, local news or organizations within communities that had community leaders, journalists, educators who would get together and they would review the performance of local media mm -hmm. and kind of give them feedback and say, here's what we think went well, here's what didn't well, and here's a suggestion of what you might want to do. Just kind of a consortium of local people who are interested and involved in it. Um, it, it ran its course and then it kind of just disappeared. But just the idea of being able to, to interact with a journalist, to be able to be a part of the community, to, to be involved with what's going on, and to kind of take that into account when you're deciding which stories to tell and how to tell them. Well, to a great extent, social media allows people to do that now in terms of, you know, interacting with the people who are telling the stories. And sometimes it's, I imagine, overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I don't know of where that, I'm, I know that's been tried, but I don't know a lot of details about it. But I think it's a wonderful idea to, yeah. to uh, engage in that kind of interaction with an audience or a potential audience to do so. I mean, in general, you have been part of journalism for, you know, some of the most tumultuous years for for journalism from the 60s to the 70s, to the 80s, the 90s, and then, you know, having an impact on all of these people who went out and did journalism then. I mean, that's got to feel, and I know you're a humble person, but that has to make you feel good that you've at least had a hand in hopefully guiding people to be those good journalists. Well, clearly that's been my goal all along is to steer them in the right direction, give them the right sense of values, make sure they know the skills they need to have, both in terms of uh, of reporting, writing, and uh, presenting it clearly, and telling good stories, and to see students that I have worked with succeed in doing that and to have wonderful careers to earn, a, earn recognition, 
is something that just continues to uh, be one of the most positive things in my life as a old retiree. <laughs> Well, Professor Hoyt, thank you so much for joining us once again on Old News with Dan and Carrie. We truly appreciate it. Yeah, I have enjoyed the interaction. I've enjoyed this opportunity to do it and uh, give me a chance to dust off some cobwebs between my ears. And uh, <laughs> thank you for challenging me on some, some uh, topics. And I was happy to be a part of your program. Thanks for tuning in to Old News with Dan and Carrie. That's old news for now. Join us next time. Yeah.